Chapter 9 of The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain. Chapter 9 it was wonderful the mastery satan had over time and distance for him they did not exist he called them human inventions and said they were artificialities we often went to the most distant parts of the globe with him and stayed weeks and months and yet were gone only a fraction of a second as a rule you could prove it by the clock one day when our people were in such awful distress because the witch commission were afraid to proceed against the astrologer and father peter's household or against any indeed but the poor and the friendless they lost patience and took to witch hunting on their own score and began to chase a born lady who was known to have the habit of curing people by devilish arts such as bathing them washing them and nourishing them instead of bleeding them and purging them through the ministrations of a barber surgeon in the proper way she came flying down with the howling and cursing mob after her and tried to take refuge in houses but the doors were shut in her face they chased her more than half an hour we following to see it and at last she was exhausted and fell and they caught her they dragged her to a tree and threw a rope over the limb, and began to make a noose in it, some holding her meantime, and she crying and begging, and her young daughter looking on and weeping, but afraid to say or do anything. They hanged the lady, and I threw a stone at her, although in my heart I was sorry for her. But all were throwing stones, and each was watching his neighbor, and if I had not done as the others did— it would have been noticed and spoken of. Satan burst out laughing. All that were nearby turned upon him, astonished and not pleased. It was an ill time to laugh, for his free and scoffing ways and his supernatural music had brought him under suspicion all over the town, and turned many privately against him. The big blacksmith called attention to him now, raising his voice so that all should hear, and said, "'What are you laughing at? Answer! Moreover, please explain to the company why you threw no stone.' "'Are you sure I did not throw a stone?' "'Yes. You needn't try to get out of it. I had my eye on you.' "'And I, I noticed you,' shouted two others. Three witnesses,' said Satan. "'Mueller, the blacksmith.' Klein, the butcher's man, Pfeiffer, the weaver's journeyman, three very ordinary liars. Are there any more? Never mind whether there are others or not, and never mind about what you consider us. Three's enough to settle your matter for you. You'll prove that you threw a stone, or it shall go hard with you. That's so, shouted the crowd, and surged up as closely as they could to the center of interest. "'And first you will answer that other question,' cried the blacksmith, pleased with himself for being mouthpiece to the public and hero of the occasion. "'What are you laughing at?' Satan smiled and answered pleasantly, "'To see three cowards stoning a dying lady when they were so near death themselves.' You could see the superstitious crowd shrink and catch their breath under the sudden shock." The blacksmith, with a show of bravado, said, "Pooh! what do you know about it? I? Everything. By profession I am a fortune-teller, and I read the hands of you three, and some others, when you lifted them to stone the woman. One of you will die to-morrow week, another of you will die to-night, the third has but five minutes to live, and yonder is the clock.' It made a sensation. The faces of the crowd blanched and turned mechanically toward the clock. The butcher and the weaver seemed smitten with an illness, but the blacksmith braced up and said with spirit, It is not long to wait for a prediction number one. If it fails, young master, you will not live a whole minute after, I promise you that. No one said anything. All watched the clock in a deep stillness which was impressive. When four and a half minutes were gone, 
the blacksmith gave a sudden gasp and clapped his hand upon his heart saying give me breath give me room and began to sink down the crowd surged back no one offering to support him and he fell lumbering to the ground and was dead the people stared at him then at satan then at one another and their lips moved but no words came then satan said three saw that i threw no stone perhaps there are others let them speak it struck a kind of panic into them and although no one answered him many began to violently accuse one another saying you said he didn't throw and getting for a reply it is a lie and i will make you eat it and so in a moment they were in a raging and noisy turmoil and beating and banging one another and in the midst was the only indifferent one the dead lady hanging from her rope her troubles forgotten her spirit at peace so we walked away and i was not at ease but was saying to myself he told them he was laughing at them but it was a lie he was laughing at me that made him laugh again and he said yes i was laughing at you because in fear of what others might report about you you stoned the woman when your heart revolted at the act but i was laughing at the others too why because their case was yours how is that well there were sixty-eight people there and sixty-two of them had no more desire to throw a stone than you had. Satan! Oh, it's true, I know your race. It is made up of sheep. It is governed by minorities, seldom or never by majorities. It suppresses its feelings and its beliefs, and follows the handful that makes the most noise. Sometimes the noisy handful is right, sometimes wrong, but no matter, the crowd follows it. The vast majority of the race, whether savage or civilized, are secretly kind-hearted and shrink from inflicting pain, but in the presence of the aggressive and pitiless minority they don't dare to assert themselves. Think of it. One kind-hearted creature spies upon another and sees to it that he loyally helps in iniquities which revolt both of them. Speaking as an expert, I know that ninety-nine out of a hundred of your race were strongly against the killing of witches when that foolishness was first agitated by a handful of pious lunatics in the long ago. And I know that even today, after ages of transmitted prejudice and silly teaching, only one person in twenty puts any real heart into the harrying of a witch and yet apparently everybody hates witches and wants them killed some day a handful will rise up on the other side and make the most noise perhaps even a single daring man with a big voice and a determined front will do it and in a week all the sheep will wheel and follow him and witch hunting will come to a sudden end monarchies aristocracies and religions are all based upon that large defect in your race the individual's distrust of his neighbor and his desire for safety's or comfort's sake to stand well in his neighbor's eye these institutions will always remain and always flourish and always oppress you affront you and degrade you because you will always be and remain slaves of minorities. There was never a country where the majority of the people were in their secret hearts loyal to any of these institutions. I did not like to hear our race called sheep, and said I did not think they were. Still it is true, lamb, said Satan. Look at you in war, what mutton you are, and how ridiculous! In war? how there has never been a just one never an honorable one on the part of the instigator of the war i can see a million years ahead and this rule will never change in so many as half a dozen instances the loud little handful as usual will shout for the war the pulpit will warily and cautiously object at first 
the great big dull bulk of the nation will rub its sleepy eyes and try to make out why there should be a war and will say earnestly and indignantly it is unjust and dishonorable and there is no necessity for it then the handful will shout louder a few fair men on the other side will argue and reason against the war with speech and pen and at first will have a hearing and be applauded but it will not last long those others will outshout them and presently the anti-war audiences will thin out and lose popularity before long you will see this curious thing the speakers stoned from the platform and free speech strangled by hordes of furious men who in their secret hearts are still at one with those stoned speakers as earlier but do not dare to say so and now the whole nation pulpit and all will take up the war cry and shout itself hoarse and mob any man who ventures to open his mouth and presently such mouths will cease to open next the statesman will invent cheap lies putting the blame upon the nation that is attacked and every man will be glad of those conscience-soothing falsities, and will diligently study them and refuse to examine any refutations of them. And thus he will by and by convince himself that the war is just, and will thank God for the better sleep he enjoys after this process of grotesque self-deception. End chapter 9 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain. Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during April 2008.